Hey, does anyone have a plug for tonight's comedy show in Detroit at the Fox Theatre? Need three ticks ASAP. We'll gladly hook up with Pistons Gear. Ticks, whatever, LOL. Hit me up. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me as always on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're going to be recapping Sunday's games. In today's show, we're going to be previewing the week ahead, which for many of you is Championship Week. We're also going to be looking at Monday for DFS, and we're going to be shining that player spotlight on Shane Larkin of the Boston Celtics. So, Michael Bolton, Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. We've got a lot to cover. Also, congratulations to those of you in the Red Rock Listener Leagues who uh, who have won your championships. Our head-to-head leagues finish this week. There is no reason in any situation that any head-to-head fantasy league should go into April. I know that's the default, and I know Yahoo doesn't let you change it because... Yeah, who's the worst fantasy site that you can play on? I'm telling you now, the lack of customization and stuff like that really bothers me a lot. I know the interface is sexy, but the lack of customization is a real pain. And going into the first week of April, um, or going as far as they go here, is, is not ideal. I know ESPN default goes to the last day of the season, which is as bananas as it gets. But at least you do have the option of bringing it forward. Um, so congratulations to you guys in the Red Rock Listen Leagues. I will announce the winners of those leagues once it's all finalized in the next couple of days. So you'll get to hear your name uh, shouted out on the podcast. Let's talk about this week ahead for those of you who are in Championship Week. It is week 24 in the NBA. And we've got another one of those weeks where early on in the week, we've got lots of streaming opportunities. On Monday, we've got five games. On Tuesday, eight. And Wednesday, eight. Thursday, 5, and then we've got Friday, 9, Saturday, 5, and Sunday, 13 games, a whopper of a Sunday. Um, and that's because Monday, there are no games due to the uh, the final of the NCAA championship. So in most cases, if there's eight games on during the day, you won't be able, oh, sorry, you will be able to stream guys in. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there's stream opportunities. Friday with 9, it's a toss-up. A lot of the times you will be as well. Sunday, almost no chance. So you've got to use your ads on that Saturday. You might be able to do it on Sunday, but pretty much every team is playing on Sunday. So you'll be able to use you know, your best players there. You want to try and maximize those games played earlier in the week without wasting every single ad because you might need specific categories towards the end of the week to really uh, round out your championship um, if we have a look at how this all works in terms of you know, maximizing players and looking at stream options on, on Monday, Tuesday, there's only one team with that back-to-back, and that's the Denver Nuggets. So you're looking at guys like Baby Neck, Wilson Chandler, if he's available, maybe Mason Plumley. If you're looking at some big man numbers, most of the other Nuggets players will already be owned. Perhaps Devin Harris, who's been getting extra minutes with Gaz Harris out, so maybe you can look at, uh, at Devin there. On Tuesday, Wednesday, we've got four teams with a back-to-back. The, the Mavericks, the Clippers, the Cavs, and the Blazers. There are options of plenty here. J.J. Barea in Dallas, Dwight Powell. I'd say Nerlens Noel, but the uh, the word out of Dallas is, is that him and Salah Mejri are going to be alternating games. So you might be able to use Nerlens one day, but then he won't be there the next day. So that's really not taking advantage fully of a back-to-back. Uh, for the Clippers, we should be able to get Ty, the list manager, Wallace, back from the G League now that the G League season is over. So getting him in the table, Montrez, Harold, Milos, Tiedosic is another guy there. In Cleveland, is Rocket Rodney Hood, Georgie Hill, Geordie Clarkson, Larry Nance, Cole Corver, who hopefully is back from his brother's uh, well, not hopefully. Hopefully for fantasy's sake, of course, he needs to take all the time that he needs uh, with his brother's funeral. And then in Portland, you're looking at guys like uh, Al Farouk Aminu. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Mo Harkless, you're looking at Shabazz Napier, uh, Eddie Davis perhaps also. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, there are no back-to-back, so no uh, double stream option there. Whereas Thursday, Saturday, which is the, the last one for the week, we're looking at the Pistons, the Warriors, the Kings, the Wizards, and the Heat. 
with that uh, with that pseudo back to back, and there are plenty of options there: Kelly Ubre, Kelly Olynyk, Jim Johnson, Tyler Johnson, Skalabisier, Bogdan Bogdanovich, De'Aaron Fox, any of those guys. The Warriors players, Uncle P, Nick Young, if he isn't owned, maybe a big man like Javale McGee if you need some blocks. Kevon Looney, Jordy Bell. Uh, and the Pistons, Reggie Jackson might be available to use there after you know, the few minutes he's been getting haven't quite been useful, but by that time he could be. Lukey Kennard looks like a real sexy option at the end of the week. Perhaps it's Stan Johnson, perhaps it's Jim Ennis, but plenty of options to round out your week to try and bring home a fantasy championship. For those of you in weekly leagues, the Toronto Raptors play only two games, the only team with two games this week. So none of those guys are realistically, in any 12-team format, going to be usable. Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, Ibaka, Valanciunas, none of these players are going to be useful. And in fact, the Raptors played Tuesday, then the next game is Saturday. So in a lot of those cases, that's three days in between. This is even for daily changes leagues. Maybe you have to drop Kyle Lowry. Maybe you drop DeMar DeRose, and you sure as shit drop Jonas Valanciunas and Serge Barker and any of these other Raptors guys, Freddie Van Vliet, to get three days worth of an extra roster spot rather than holding them on for that one game against Boston on Saturday. We do have the majority of teams playing four games. The Pistons, the Mavericks, the Sixers, Warriors, Clippers, Hornets, Bucks, Kings, Bulls, Nuggets, Lakers, Suns, Cavs, Wizards, Blazers, Grizzlies, and Timberwolves all play four games this week. So majority of those players are going to start, or the, you know, the, the players you've got on your roster will be starting. The decisions you're going to have to make are with the three-game teams, the Magic, the Heat, the Hawks, the Knicks, the Spurs, Pelicans, Thunder, Pacers, Jazz, Nets, Rockets, and Celtics. The Celtics have the toughest uh, matchup, even though they do start the week against the Suns. They, then they come up against the Jazz and the Raptors, some pretty tough defenses, while the Rockets and the Nets also have some tougher defenses to match up against, while the Magic, the Heat, and the Hawks have the easiest schedule of those three game teams. Of course, you can check all of this out on Basketball Monster with our weekly schedule analyzer, our weekly projections that takes into account you know, back-to-backs and rests and home and road and opponent defense when trying to project out the uh, the performances of your players. But of course, plenty of stuff can change given rests and weird injuries and, and odd oddities that do go on at this time of the year, in particular across the NBA. Let's have a look now at the uh, at the week, weekend recap for some teams that we aren't going to really touch on too much in today's show. We will start by looking at the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, where are we? Yep, the Pelicans team who played over the weekend. Interestingly here, there was the play of Czech Diallo, 26 minutes. They did move Emma Karoka for to the bench and started Darius Miller. Uh, that was with Nikola Mirotic out, but it doesn't really matter because Mirotic wasn't starting. So it was an interesting change. Okafor played only eight minutes while Diallo played 26 and had 15 and nine with a steal and a block. If that keeps up and that trend has been happening, I think once out of the last five games, Diallo's played more than, uh, sorry, once in the last five games, Okafor has played more than Diallo. So that should be a, setting off your spidey senses that you know, Czech is really working his way into a solid role. And, you know, 26 minutes, 15 and 9 a steal and a block is absolutely 12 team value. If Mirotic is there, he probably doesn't play 26 minutes, but in 22 minutes, there is some short term value there for a guy like Shek Diallo. Uh, not a lot else to talk about. Rajan Rondo was out over the weekend. He should be back for their next game, though, apparently. On the Dallas Mavericks, we had Dennis Smith Jr. return. Nolan's Noel was awesome, 10 and 10 and 12 with four steals and a block. But as I said, the up and down nature of is he going to play, is he not, makes him not a guy that you can necessarily just go, bang, I'm locking him in and holding on to him. I don't think that's the best way to go. Doug McDirt scored well. We can't rely upon that, obviously. And if you are ready to lose field goal percentage or... Um, yeah, but you punt that category. Dennis Smith, if he's on the wire, you absolutely need to go and grab him. Dwighty Powell's minutes have dipped, so he is far from a must-own player at, uh, at this point in the season. The Orlando Magic, it doesn't appear like we're going to be getting Evan Fournier back anytime soon. Um, John Isaac and John Simmons also didn't play across the weekend, so we finally got good Mario Hazonia back. He was really fantastic, 14-8-4, and four, four steals and two blocks. And while Simmons, Fournier, and Isaac are out, he does have some value, but this is the first game he's really shown it in the last two weeks. Augustine needs to be owned, while well, Shelvin Mack also is getting a boost in that sort of circumstance. The last team we want to talk about is the Chicago Bulls. No Chris Dunn, Larry Markinen played one game and then set out the next one. Uh, no Zach Levine. I don't think Levine's going to be coming back. So Denzel the Hammer Valentine played really well. 19-4-3. 
uh, average across the two games the Bulls played. He's getting steals. He's hitting threes. He can be a little bit touch and go, but as long as Levine is out and to a lesser extent Dunn, he is going to be a relatively solid option. Campaign also, as long as Dunn is out, has value. While we saw a, a, an oddity with Chicago, they started a game with Lopez and Holiday both starting. Neither played large minutes, and Chris Felicio is a sneaky back end uh, big man given he's just consistently putting up some numbers, but that should dip when Markinen returns and... Uh, Although it, it, although it may not, although that would force a little bit more of Noel Vonley across to center, taking maybe two or three minutes off the top of what uh, Chris Felizio has been putting out there, which has been, as I said, relatively impressive. Let's uh, go on to the action from Sunday now. We'll go to the monstrous line of the night, and it's Terry Rozier of the Boston Celtics, 33-5-3 and three for Rozier. Eight triples, almost a Celtics record, which is nine five steals, 12 of 16 from the field, and hit his only free throw. Really great stuff from Rozier. With Kyrie Irving out for the rest of the regular season, he is as must-own as it gets. He's a top 25 player over the last two weeks, playing 36 minutes a night. No Kyrie, no Marcus Smart. He's going to play big minutes the rest of the way, and it's a clear case of him being a must-own guy. He's uh, 135th on the season in 25 minutes per game, shooting only 41%, but that has improved significantly over the second half of the season. In the last month, he's actually a 45% shooter, including 44% from three. Uh, he gets steals, he gets assists, he gets rebounds, and I don't know how many times I've said it this year, when he gets minutes, he produces, and we are seeing that in a huge, huge way at the moment for Rosier really putting up those numbers. And I think this may be his first monstrous line of the night, but clearly well-deserved for uh, for Tito Three Sticks. The waiver wire line of the night goes to Jumpin' Joe Harris of the Brooklyn Nets. He had 30 points with six triples and also added seven rebounds, two assists, and a steal and shot the ball well, 11 of 14 from the field. Amazingly, Harris is a top 120 player over the last two weeks in only 25 minutes per game hitting two threes a game and scoring 11 points. But that's that value is really propped up by the fact he's shooting 57% over that time. So not someone that I'm going, shit, 117th, got to go and add Joe Harris. A nice three-point streamer, along with, say, Marco Bellinelli, JJ Redick, uh, Nick Young, Troy Daniels, those sort of players, but far from a must-own guy outside of you know, 16 team leagues. The Nets, weirdly, at this point of the year, have shortened their rotation. Nick Stauskas is not playing. Quincy Ace is out of the rotation. And that's allowing his minutes to be bumped up a little bit. And when the Nets play on uh, on low-volume days, which, do, I, do they actually do that? Yeah, they've got two quality games next week. So you might be able to stream him in and get some... Um, and get some value there, get some points, get some threes, but he's far from a Mustang guy, but definitely a name to remember as the Nets have gone shorter in their rotation. The young gun of the night is the artist formerly known as Torian Prince. Prince has been ludicrous recently, 28 and 6, with three triples, two assists, and two steals on 11 of 18 shooting. He is, over the last month, a top 20 player. I, I can't believe it. Um, and, and I think the best thing about looking at that is he's doing it shooting 43%. So it's not this Joe Harris situation of 57% shooting, really bumping his numbers up. His usage is way up to 25% uh, compared to a 21% usage on the uh, on the uh, as a whole. You know, Kent Bazemore being out is helping him, but the steals are there. He's getting you almost three assists per game, which is, I think, an underrated part of his game. Hitting three and a half triples, almost averaging 20 points per game. He has been a completely frustrating player this year. I banged on and banged on about him, saying you have to hold, you have to hold for so long. And then eventually, he just fell apart. The minutes weren't there, and nothing was going right for him at, in this stage through, uh, I think, early January. And I said, look, if you want to cut, you can. But I don't think his minutes are uh, going to go anywhere really long term. And then since then, he has been you know, absolutely ridiculous. And he's a top 80 player on the season and coming good really at the right time of the year, putting up some absolutely fantastic performances. And it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. The dud of the night. I tell a man's not hot. Carmelo Anthony was just shitful in this game for the Thunder, turning the ball over, missing a late shot. Billy Donovan, uh, just, I, I don't know. I, I, have, I have worries about what Billy Donovan can do as a coach. He's very much a going rep, reputation sort of a thing. We've heard it so many times. Mallow would be better off the bench. Mallow would be better off the bench, but he refuses to do it. And even today, Jeremy Grant clearly outplayed Carmelo Anthony. He had an absolute stinker, and Donovan was out there. Oh, Mallow's been a great scorer in this league and made big shots. Cool. 
um, that that's fine. Michael Jordan also has been a great scorer in this league and made big shots. I wouldn't be wanting to run him out there now. Kobe Bryant also has been a you know, big-time scorer in the league. I wouldn't want to be running. Joe Johnson. Look, there are plenty of players like that. And at some point, you have to say that Mallow's just not... Well, he's not. He's not the same player he was. He's shooting 41% for the year. He's outside the top 125. Uh, in fantasy ranks. He is not a 10-team league guy. He is not, I believe, a 12-team league guy. You can find what he does in many other places. He is more of a JJ Redick three-point streamer than a must-own player. Been a real disappointment for Mallow coming across. He's averaging six points per game fewer this year. The assists have dropped significantly as well. He was at three last year. He's at 1.3. His steal numbers are down. His efficiency is down, which playing alongside Paul George and Russell Westbrook, you'd think at least he'd be able to hit his shots at a better rate, but that hasn't been the case. He's only at 36% from three, actually 35.5, and and he was at 36% last year. So a real disappointing time for Carmelo Anthony this season. And of course, if you drafted him in fantasy, you would know all about that. He is not a... You are better off streaming guys in uh, in, instead of holding on to a guy like Carmelo Anthony at uh, at this point in the season. he is uh, He's really, really struggling, and I don't see too much change. There'll be a big game maybe here and there, but not a guy you need to hold on to. Let's go into these games and talk about the action from Sunday. Am, I am recording this uh, with a couple of minutes left in the uh, in the Golden State Utah game. So by the time we get to that game, that should be uh, that should be done and dusted, and we can talk about it. The first game of the I was going to say of the night, but it was really early in the day. The Cavs and the Nets. The Cavs are, are rolling at the moment. Yes, the last two opponents have been Phoenix and Brooklyn, but they're killing it. Kevin Love, in particular, has notched four assists in three of the four games since he's been back. That's pushing towards those numbers he used to put up in Minnesota. And as the second option on this team, without another dominant ball handler like Kyrie or Isaiah Thomas, Love is uh, is really showing his worth. 20 and 15 with four assists, while LeBron had 37, 10 and 8. LeBron James. Um, Rocket Rodney Hood, 16 off the bench in 33 minutes. I think the 33 minutes is more impressive than anything else. Well, Georgie Hill had 17, 4, and 5 in 37 minutes, and that's also impressive. But, of course, no Kyle Korver, no Jeff Green in this one. My name is Jeff. So it's hard to get a full understanding of how those minutes are going to be distributed. Jose Calderon started. He played 16 minutes. I'd have to imagine when Corver is back that Calderon will go out of the rotation and Corver will just slot into there. But we've also got to find some room for Green in this rotation. I don't know how that works with that. I think you probably see Hood drop three or four minutes. Uh, he'll drop five or six minutes. Clarkson drop four or five minutes. Maybe J.R. Smith loses three minutes to get these guys back into the rotation. Larry Nance returned uh, as a starter next to Kevin Love, but got into foul trouble and only managed 17 minutes. Two points, one rebound, and one steal. With Tristan Thompson and Kevin Love back, he's not going to reach the heights he did earlier in this uh, tenure for Cleveland when he was starting, but he still could be in low 20s minutes, a 12-team league guy, but I don't think that it's a must-do now with these other guys around. But it's hard to get a full judge in this game just because of the foul trouble that bothered him. On the net, Spencer Dinwiddie played better, had 16-4-2, but still didn't crack 25 minutes, and that's three games in a row where he hasn't got to 25 minutes, and that's pretty tough to hold on to him. Uh, D'Angelo Russell struggled a bit, 12 points with four triples, but still, I would much rather have him than Dinwiddie at this point. While um, Damari Carroll had 18-5-5, five five, obviously a really strong performance from him. Jarrett Allen did not play well. It's a bad matchup for him against Love and Nance. Four and three in 21 minutes, but he's more of a defensive blocks specialist at this point in fantasy leagues outside of deeper leagues. I still really do believe in that he can be a top 70 guy, maybe as early as next year, probably the year after. As long as he's getting 28 minutes a night, he can be a starting center, uh, like a Clint Capella light type of a player. So keep an eye on him in dynasty formats. While well, Karis Levert had eight, four, and seven in a pretty solid role. He is a nice stream option for some points and steals and assists but I don't think that we should be labeling him as a must-own guy. The San Antonio Spurs and the Milwaukee Bucks. Pau Gasol had been terrible recently, but he played well. 24 minutes, 22 and 13. I'm not rushing to grab Pau in this one. A 33% usage is not something I think we should expect all the time. While DeJounte Murray had 10 and 9 and LaMarcus had 34 and 7. Really just more of the same from a lot of these Spurs guys. Pat Mills struggled. Four points. Nowhere near a 12-team league guy. While Kyle Anderson only played 24 minutes as they gave some extra minutes to, uh, to Rudy Gay. Uh, Anderson had 6-6. Six and six. I don't think he's a must-own guy. I think he's fine. 
if you want to maybe stream in some assists or steals, but he wouldn't be a guy that I'm going, I've got to just really lock into Kyle Anderson here for these remaining couple of weeks of the NBA season. Onto the Bucks, Yanni returned and had 25 and 10 with three triples. That's, I think, the biggest surprise there is he hit three threes, while Chrissy Middleton had 19, 7, and 4. And with Adedokumpo back, Jabari Parker went back to 18 minutes, and we should be well aware by now that the fact that Parker is getting 18 to 23 minutes a night is not an injury thing. Because in the two games where Yanni was out, well, Yanni was out one, then missed the second half, Parker exceeded 30 minutes in both of those games. So it's not a health thing. It's not that. It's the fact that they just don't can't find the minutes for him. So while... Yeah, he had a really good game when um, when Yanni was out. I think it's hard to hold a bloke that's getting 23 minutes a game and not a big contributor in all the categories. Brandon Jennings had eight, Shabazz Muhammad, so I had five, Shabazz had eight, while Jason Terry went back to starting shooting guard. I don't care if they start Jason Terry or Tone Snell or Sterling Brown, which has happened over the last four games. Those three guys have started games. And none of them are standard league players. Snell has a real risk of being out of the rotation when Dalva Dover and Brogdon return, if they ever return. Um, while Sterling Brown was actually out of the rotation. Interestingly, Thon McCurr is back and playing ahead of Tyler Zeller, or more minutes than Tyler Zeller, but none of that's really having an impact in standard leagues. While Johnny Henson, the Muppet, had 10, 6, and 4 with three blocks. Really a strong blocks option, uh, and the minutes are up at the moment under under Joe Prunty. Let's see if that remains, but you know, the three-center rotation always makes you a little bit nervous about that. The Miami Heat and the Indiana Pacers still no Hassan Whiteside. So Alinek had 12, 9, and 9 with three steals in the overtime game in 32 minutes. Shot poorly, but just racks up numbers continually. The assists are absolutely flummoxing from him. He just continues to rack them up at a high rate. While Tyler Johnson had 19, 3, and 4 with five triples. 70% shooting, which allowed him to play extra time and have these uh, bigger numbers. But he's been up and down, and I wouldn't be look rushing to grab him. Dwayne Wade was also good, 13, 4, and 7 with two blocks. That's nice numbers from Wade, but really a 14 to 16 team league guy. While Bam Adebayo had probably his best game without Whiteside, 14 and 5, but only the 21 minutes. Wasn't a good Joshy Richardson game, still needs to be owned. While Jim Johnson had 15 and 9, shot poorly from the line, but that's still good enough, at least until Whiteside returns. And when Whiteside returns, Johnson and Olenek are likely to cop a, cop a hit, but I could see for the first two or three games there, Olenek exceeding the playing time of Whiteside as he returns from this hip thing, and I think that Hassan misses at least another one or two, but that's pure speculation on my behalf. For the Pacers, DeMontis Sabonis looked like he was set to return and then sprained his ankle again in warm-ups. It doesn't appear too serious. They said he should return at some point on the upcoming four-game road trip. But that doesn't look great, obviously. But with him out, it means Thad Young gets extra run. He had 22 and 9 with five steals and three blocks, really filling it up defensively, and he should be owned. While uh, Miles Turner, he struggled, but he got the 32 minutes. Seven points on one of eight shooting, eight boards, four assists, and two blocks. If those shots just fell in, everything would be looking a lot sexier with that line. But of course, he still needs to be owned. While Boyan Bogdanovich, two hot games in a row, 18 and 8. We know how quickly it can turn, we know how bad it can get for Bogdanovich, but as a points and threes guy, uh, he, he's useful while he's shooting like this. And then when he goes one of nine, you go, well, you know what? I, I knew that was coming. Daz Collison was okay, as was Corey Joseph with nine, 10, and seven, but I wouldn't be buying too much into that sort of a performance from Joseph. The Clippers and the Raptors, big win for the Clippers here. Lou Williams uh, was really good, 26, two, and seven with the triple one. Uh, as I said before, the list manager, Ty Wallace, should be back for this team for their next game. And the rooster, Danilo Gallinari, is also a chance to return. So some things will change with Sendarius Thornwell's minutes. Sammy Decker, he'll likely be out of the rotation. Wes Johnson, who started here and did what he does. Steal, block, three triples, but he could very well see his playing time cut to almost nothing. Austin Rivers, still available in leagues. Uh, he's 11-1-4 with four steals. He should be owned. While Milos Teodosic has now played 30-plus minutes in two consecutive games. He had 15-4, and four, only one assist. He's more of an assist and threes streamer than a must-own guy. While the table, Montrez Harrell, just continues to put up high usage, high efficiency, 19 points in 19 minutes with six rebounds. Very little else, and he will cost you some free throws. Uh, he was one of two here. That can be a real negative. But if you need that short-term points, rebounds, field goal percentage boost, Harrell is one of the best ones out there to do that for you. On to the Raptors. Jonas Valanciunas, only 20 minutes for, for JV. Had some foul trouble, but 16 and 10 and a triple one. He is producing at an elite rate 
in limited minutes. Lowry and DeRozan both struggled their way through while Freddie Van Vliet had 16 points with two assists in 22 minutes. A strong game from Van Vliet, but as I said before, after Tuesday, they don't play again until Saturday. So these guys like Van Valanciunas, Van Vliet, Ibaka, uh, DeLon Wright, if you're owning any of those guys, they, they can probably be dropped in that situation. Serge Ibaka went for 30 minutes for the second consecutive game, 12-8. and eight. He is not going to remain a must-own guy, and he's not a weekly league start for this week. The Boston Celtics and the Sacramento Kings. Jalen Brown returned from his concussion 19-2 and with a triple one. If he was dropped, yeah, of course you go and add him. While Al Horford, a lot of people were dropping Al Horford. He had 14-5-8 and with a block and a three in 32 minutes. All it needed was the field goal percentage to turn around, and it did here. And that's a really sexy line from Horford. Of course, if he was dropped, you add him immediately. With the return of Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum's minutes did go down 28 minutes. That's back to what he was getting uh, before all those injuries struck, you still want to hold him, but let's monitor how that goes. There was also no Marcus Morris in this game, so how he impacts uh, Tatum's minutes is going to be very interesting. While Greg Monroe, who'd been killing it, he was shit. Four points in uh, two of 10 shooting with eight rebounds, but he's still providing good enough value where you can consider him even a 12-team league guy. Probably more 14, though. No Zach Randolph or Garrett Temple. Budrick Heel dropped 21-6 and six with three steals. He is playing really strong at the moment. He's a guy to own. I'd even probably own him at the moment over Bogdan Bogdanovich and over De'Aaron Fox. Those guys are up and down, and they're very much borderline players. And a lot of the time, I'd rather have that spot for streaming. Whereas Scal LeBissier had 14-5. and five. 30 minutes for Scal. But of course, when uh, Randolph returns from his illness... What are they going to do with Scal? No doubt they'll drop him back to 24 minutes and really eliminate his value. So while Randolph is out, there is value for Scal, but I just don't see it being a long-term thing given how it's been uh, run all season here in Sacramento. New York Knicks, they finally did it. They started Frank Nilakina and played him 21 minutes while they gave Courtney Lee 27 off the bench. Just complete frustration again, playing Frank out of position. He wasn't very good, I'll, I'll grant you that, and the Knicks got the win. But still, the, the nonsense of what they do is is always there. Um, interestingly, they moved Manny Moutier to the bench and started Trey Burke, and Moutier was more successful off the bench, 11, 6, and 7. I wouldn't buy that because he's not going to be a 50% shooter, and he's not going to be as uh, energetic as he was in this game. While Trey Burke had 19, 2, and 3 with 3 steals and shot the ball. He continues to shoot the ball really well this year, Trey Burke, something I never expected to say. He's an okay 12-team league ad, but far from a priority player. The Cock Monster was also out of this one with a hip injury, so that meant that Luke Cornett played 19 minutes. Just watch that situation, because if O'Quinn misses again, then Cornett is someone that uh, can be a deeper league streamer guy. But if Kyle plays, then Luke may go back to the G League, and they might bring Isaiah Hicks back up to play some of those minutes. Uh, on to the Wizards. Still no John Wall, of course. Saturansky had 9, 4, and 10 with 3 steals and a block. He's not an auto drop because I think he'll still play you know, 28, 27 minutes while Wall, Wall gets re, uh, re into the action with his uh, get his uh, fitness back up. Mark Heath had 13 and 4 with 3 blocks and he should be owned. While Kelly Oubre, it wasn't a great shooting night for Oubre. Just 1 of 3 from the line and 6 of 14 from the field for 13 and 5. But he is one of the best steals and points 12-team league streamers without being a must-own guy. Brad Beal, also just horrendous from the field, 29% for 14 points, while Mike Scott uh, did his little bit in 26 minutes, while Jan Mihinmi and Marcin Gortat both struggled in a big, big way. The next game we look at, the Portland Trailblazers and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Mo Harkless apparently now is the greatest shooter of all time, just hitting 60% of his shots without even worrying about it. He had 16, 6, and 4 with four blocks. So not only is he hitting his shots, but now he thinks he's a playmaker. Now he thinks he's a rim protector. He was as shit as you could get to begin this season. But recently he has been on fire, a top 70 player over the last two weeks. He has hit over 60% of his shots in Five of his past six games, which is ludicrous to me. Today's game is a little bit anomalous with the four blocks and the four assists, but he's putting up enough value where you have to go, you know what? For those defensive numbers, this uptick in his efficiency, which again, it has been you know, really surprising, there is some value there. It's not for everyone. It really depends on how your team looks and, and if you can... If you need what he offers, then yeah, there is some value for Mo Harkless, but it's been an, an amazing run. 
Lillard and McCollum were fantastic. CJ dropped in 34 points on 58% shooting, while Yusuf Nurkic's minutes are back up. 30 minutes, 17 and 12, two steals and two blocks. Uh, and that's that's nullifying guys like Zach Collins and Eddie Davis, who both struggled in this one. Evan Turner looked like he had some issues with his leg and back again. He could uh, he could miss some time. He did return to the bench, but uh, didn't get back into the game. That's not really impacting us too much, though. Onto the Thunder, Westbrook had 23-8-9 with four steals, while Steve Adams had 18-10. and 10. Big games from those guys, while Paul George's field goal percentage could have cost some people leagues. It was a shit performance in terms of his shooting, 4 of 15. There... Talked about Jeremy Grant earlier. He had 17 points on only five shots. That's obviously ludicrous and has absolutely zero chance of being replicated. And according to Billy Donovan, he's just not going to get extra minutes no matter, no matter how often he outplays Carmelo Anthony. He can be a blocks streamer, but that's really about it. There's no real threat of him start, starting to play 27 a night and Mallow playing 27. Uh, Donovan just isn't going to do that. The next game we look at, the Atlanta Hawks and the Houston Rockets. Just an absolute bloodbath. Dennis Schroeder was out with his ankle issue, so Isaiah Taylor started. He had 26 points with three assists and three triples. As long as Schroeder is out, Taylor is going to be that option there. I don't know if we're going to see Malcolm Delaney back before the end of the year. DeAndre Bembry is continually out, so Taylor and Josh Majet are the only point guards on this roster, so Isaiah can be looked at. Talked about the artist already. While uh, Tyler Dorsey had a big game, 16-5 and five with four triples in 29 minutes. He's been really up and down, and I wouldn't be reading too much into that. But I love what I'm seeing from Mike Muscala. The Moose had 13-6 and six with a three and three assists. Didn't get any blocks, but the minutes are up. Miles Plumley's out of the rotation, thank God. Tyler Kavanagh barely played. So Muscala, in certain spots, he can be a sneaky 12-team league guy. The Undertaker wasn't awesome. He had 6-7, and seven, while the Baptist John Collins only played 25 minutes. It was far from his best game as well. But 6-10 and 10 for him with a block, I would still be owning him, and I would own him over Deadman. I would own him clearly over Muscala. I think Muscala is still the third-string guy that you want to own behind Collins, Deadman, and Muscala, but that doesn't mean that he can't have some value. Jimmy Harden had a triple-double, 18, 10, and 15 in only 30 minutes. And Mike D'Antoni said a couple of things before the game. He said that he was going to try and limit him to 31 to 32 minutes a game with the occasional 38-minute game in there, in there to keep his conditioning up, so lower minutes for Harden. And he's also going to rest one or two games. Now, that doesn't mean that you're doing anything with Harden. It's It sucks, clearly, that you're going to lose... 20% of his production, perhaps. But what it does mean is it gives extra minutes to Gerald Green. And the games where Harden rests, Green's going to have an opportunity to be an option. He had 25-7 and seven with five triples here, Gerald, in a game where Chris Paul was out. Now, clearly, 67% shooting is not something to stick. But as a point streamer, as a three-point streamer, Gerald Green's going to be a name to watch. Eric Gordon also thrived without Chris Paul, 22-2-4 with four triples of steal and a block. But we know the story. When Harden and Paul are there, his assists drop, his free throw attempts drop, and he's nowhere near this successful, and he becomes a points and threes streamer. Uh, Luke Marmute is likely out one more game, while Chris Paul will return next game, as will Ryan Anderson, most likely. Uh, Anderson, again, really just a three-point streamer, while Clint Capella had 14-8 and eight with two steals and two blocks. Another strong performance from him. All right, let's uh, refresh this uh, box score to see how things are looking with the, uh, oh, the Warriors and the Jazz have finished. Perfect timing for that game. Uh, let's have a look at that. All right, so... Uh, the, the Jazz with the big victory over the Warriors. Steph Curry not only ruled out of the regular season, but Steve Kerr said he won't play in the first round of the playoffs. Of course, uh, we'll get to Quinn Cook in a second. For the Jazz, just really a fair bit of the same here. Big games from Rudy Gobert, Jingle and Joe Ingles, 17 and 15 for Gobert with four blocks, while Ingles had 14, 6 and 8. The Don, Donovan Mitchell had 21, 2 and 6, while uh, Ravishing Rick Rubio, the only real starter to struggle, had 11 and 3. But this is the most encouraging thing to come out of this is the play of Dante Exum. 17 minutes for Exum, 13, 1 and 5. Looked excellent in the second quarter. And yeah, that should be giving some hope. Now, he's heading into his restricted free agency season. What will they do with him? Um, I will, I'm almost certain that they will retain him. Now, whether he becomes a starter next year or the year after, or they just continually play him in a 24-minute hybrid backup role behind and use a Mitchell, uh, Mitchell Exum Rubio uh, backcourt, which I think is probably more likely for next year. But Exum has been, you know, preseason, uh, summer league, in these games now, he's shown that perhaps he can be a fantasy contributor. So he's a name to watch in the deeper dynasty leagues. 
Derek Favors had been playing well, but didn't do too much here. Ten and eight, really just a borderline twelve team league guy. But this this game was a blowout in the end. On to the Warriors. Quinny Cook had 17, 4, and 8 with a triple one. He is a must own player at this point. Clay Thompson, um, likely back maybe at the end of this week while Kevin Durant's a chance to return earlier in the week, but we don't know at this point. Kavon Looney continues to impress. 6 and 5 for Kavon, two steals and two blocks. And I wouldn't be shocked if he went to a team that needs a power forward if he was a top 150 player next year. That's a lot of ifs and a lot of situations that need to happen, but he's been super impressive, especially with his shot blocking. Steve Kerr said that Andre Iguodala and Sean Livingston are going to have their minutes monitored and limited for the rest of the year. Iguodala played only 19 minutes here. We're not really looking to, to grab him anywhere. Well, Paddy McCaw played 34 and Uncle P. Nick Young played 38. Neither of those guys did a huge amount. Uh, Young is more of a points and threes guy uh, until Clay returns, far from what I would call a 100% must-own guy, whereas McCaw is still more of that deeper league guy. There was no Draymond, no Durant, no Clay, no Steph in this game. Draymond should be back next game. And again, Durant is an has an opportunity to return. We also had JaVale McGee starting 8-9 and nine with two blocks. That's obviously really useful those two blocks, those nine rebounds, but we have no guarantee that he will continue to start. Perhaps this was a Rudy Gobert matchup thing for JaVale, um, but look, just keep an eye on that. There can be some block value that comes out of him. All right, that, uh, that does it for all of the action from, uh, from Sunday's game. We will now go and look at the player spotlight where we're going to head to Boston, and then we're going to preview the action for, um, uh, for Monday for DFS. All right, let's, uh, let's go to Boston and let's look at the player spotlight. And today's player spotlight is Shane Larkin of those Boston Celtics. Now, as I talked about with Terry Rogier earlier, there's plenty of minutes available in this backcourt for Larkin with the Celtics. Um, he is averaging 26 minutes over the last three games. In fact, uh, against Portland a couple of days ago, he played 34 minutes there. Now, this is not you know, super spectacular by any means what he's doing, but he is a top 160 player over the last two weeks and top 130 over the last week, which coincidentally, or perhaps uh, not coincidentally, no, nah, coincidentally, it's a, it's a better rank than where Carmelo Anthony lies. In his last three games, Larkin is averaging four assists per game. Now, he can be a pretty good steals guy, and over the last two years, he's averaged 1.2 steals in under 25 minutes per game. He's nowhere near that this season but he can get better in that area. So he can be a threes guy. He can be an assists guy. He can be a steals guy. And recently, his field goal percentage is well up, and he hasn't missed a free throw. Granted, he hasn't taken many, but in the last 22 games, he has not missed a free throw. So there's some value there. It doesn't get to the line all that much, but if you're going 100% on almost two attempts per game, that can have some sort of an influence across three or four games. That's a perfect eight out of eight, and maybe maybe seven out of eight. But you could expect eight out of eight if you haven't if he hasn't missed a bloody shot in three months. You've got uh, you've got a, a fair degree of um, certainty in what he's going to do. He is a guy that's it's bounced around. He played in Dallas, played in New York, played in Brooklyn, and he's a player that I've liked through all these stops. I thought he could be interesting in terms of his ability to get assists and get steals in fantasy leagues. It hasn't necessarily come to fruition always, but last year in 22 minutes per game playing for Brooklyn, he was um, the 165th ranked player. He was 200th the year before playing for New York. I just don't ever see him becoming a starting point guard in the NBA, which is what he would need to do to become... Sorry, not last year for Brooklyn. I meant uh, two years ago because he didn't play in the NBA last year. Um, I don't ever see him becoming a full-time starting point guard in the NBA. Defensively, he, he's strong. Um, shooting still needs a little bit of work, but I, I do like what he can bring. He's not a player that's been a, a significant positive player on the court. As a, you know, throughout his career, he's had one positive year that first year in Dallas and the last, two, last three seasons he's played in the NBA have been marginal negatives. He's 3.6 points worse off with him on the court this season, the Celtics are, as opposed to when he's on the bench. And negative box score plus minus every year in his career has never posted a positive or an above average win share number, never posted an above average true shooting or PER. So none of the advanced stats you know, at the age of 25 really like Larkin. He can be that guy, especially when this opportunity is opened up for him in Boston, that can have some 12-team value. But if we're looking at him long-term, I think his best position or you know, role is going to be backup point guard on a bad team, 
third or fourth string point guard on a good team. Now, if he was in Golden State with the situation here, he may be in line you know, for uh, what Quinn Cook's doing and being really valuable. And he's showing what he can do in this in this role for Boston. And this is the perfect role for him. But expanding his role upon this, you know, getting yeah, he's never going to be a high usage, high efficiency sort of player. This is sort of who he is. Look for someone over the last 10 games of the season, nine games of the season, to provide you with some assists, maybe three a game, maybe four a game, maybe a steal a game, and give you one to one and a half threes a game. That can be valuable for the rest of this season. But from here on out, I'm not really sure that I see a huge role for him in the NBA. So dynasty-wise, not a massive amount to look for for Shane Larkin, even though I do think that he is a player that I do like watching and I've liked seeing him over the past couple of years. I'm just not super sold on uh, on his value as we move forward. Let's now look at the uh, games for... Monday in the NBA, we've only got five games up on the slate. So again, at this time of the year, remember that we're trying to limit our DFS exposure because bullshit happens all over the place, especially on a five-game slate. There's a ton of variance. The first game we look at is Denver at Philadelphia. The Sixers have been crushing people. They are favored by five and a half, and the total is 223.5 points here. Um, Point guards. The Blue Arrow, 7,500 for Jamal Murray. He's been playing some pretty big minutes with Gaz Harris out. So I think that you can look at him and go, yeah, 40 points is not a not a big stretch for him to get to. And I think he can do that, but I wouldn't be locking him in as a cash guy or anything along those lines. TJ McConnell, no no interest there. At shooting guard, Farton, Will Barton. I really like this. 7,100 for him. He's averaging 42 over the last three big minutes playing pretty well at the moment, contributing in multiple categories, which should allow him to exceed that 35-point mark pretty comfortably. So I like him. JJ Redick, no interest whatsoever. Same with Marco Bellinelli. Whereas Devin Harris, the minutes have been up. He's averaging 27 over his last three with Gary Harris out. But I'm not sure that there's any real upside in using Devin. At small forward, we've got Bob Covert, 5,900. A strong game from him last time out against Minnesota, 37 points in 28 minutes. But we're really looking at him as a, as a tournament guy. Same with Baby Neck, Wilson Chandler, who's up to 6,000. I would take Covington over him every day of the week in a tournament. But uh, Chandler's shown he's shown some big games, but he also uh, has a little bit of a shit the bettiness, if that is actually a word, which, of course, it's not. At power for Dario Saric at 5,900. The numbers have been well down for Saric, averaging 21 over the past five in only 24 minutes, but there's been a lot of blowouts there. I'm not sure that it's going to be a blowout against Denver, so I think at this reduced price for Dario that he is absolutely worth a look at that sort of a salary. Ilyasova, Plumley, no. Benny Simmons at 9,800. A really positive matchup for Simmons against Jamal Murray. He is putting up triple doubles almost every time he's out there, but that price is fairly expensive, and I think it's more of a tournament play rather than a cash one. Paulie Millsap at 7,000 also. I'm not really all that keen on that one. Uh, Nick Jokic, 9,500 for Yoke. Uh, look, just giving you 40, 45 almost every night, which is a pretty good floor for cash, plus the clear 70, 75 point upside. So I think he's uh, worthwhile in both formats. Well, Joel Embiid is coming in at 10,300. The minutes have been reduced lately. He's averaging only 25 over his last five. That's not an Embiid thing. That's a Sixers thing because of how comfortable they've been winning these games. But that also makes it hard to use him in cash when we know that as soon as a game gets out of hand, they're going to pull him out and and limit what he can do. So that uh, makes it hard to, to roster him in any cash lineup. On DraftKings... Uh, the Blue Arrows at 73, I like that. Now, Embiid at 9-4 is way sexier on DraftKings. It's still probably lean more tournament, but if you think this game is going to be close, then you look at that as cash value. I think Jokic, I think Simmons, Barton, and Sharich all have cash value on DraftKings as well. While Paulie Millsap, the price at 6100 does make him fairly appealing. I still wouldn't be locking him in as a, as a must-roster player or anything along those lines. Let's go to the next one now. We're going to talk the New York Knicks and the Charlotte Hornets. The Hornets are favored by 11 and a half. The total is 223. Kimber Walker's coming off an absolute monster of a game last time out. We don't know if Kylo Quinn is going to play. We don't know if Nick Batum is going to play. Obviously, if Batum is out, we're looking at Jez Lamb. If O'Quinn is out, it boosts the value of Cantor and it ups the appeal of Luke Cornett in tournaments. 
I would imagine that Trey Burke and Frankie Nilakina will start again. So Burke at 4,900, I think that's a fairly strong cash option here. Whereas Walker at 8,600, just putting up numbers fairly consistently most games. Um, but that price is pretty high. If you can find the right guys to go around him in cash, fine. I, I just don't think it's going to be that easy at that sort of a price. So I'd look at him as more of a tournament guy. Uh, Nilla Keener at 3,500 is a GPP sort of a guy, but not really a, not really a must roster guy or, or anything along those lines. While Moutier played well today, clearly. But uh, I don't think we should be expecting that off the bench again. Timmy Hardaway had 6,100. Uh wasn't quite as good today, but I still think that that's a worthwhile use of, of uh, $6,100. He's been a fairly solid cash game player. Well, Batum, I, just, I really doubt that Nick plays. Um, Malik Monk at 4200 Nah, no interest there. At small forward, Kid Gilchrist, nope. Troy Williams, nope. Michael Beasley at 5800 I think that's a strong tournament play, but I don't want anything to do in cash. Well, Jez Lamb's at 7000 Even if Batum is out, I think 7000 is a ludicrous price for Jeremy Lamb. He's more of a 6000 6200 sort of a guy. At 7000 I just think there is absolutely no winning with that price. Marvin Williams at power forward, 4,200, just as unexciting an option as you can get, so no thanks. While well, Frank the Tank Kaminsky at 4,700. Cody Zeller is out, so uh, Frank at 4,700. Uh, there is some GPP upside there, but really not a massive, massive amount, not enough to get me interested. While well, Cornette, as I mentioned, a minimum salary player who can give you 24, 25 points if O'Queen is missing. Speaking of O'Quinn, he's at $5,000. If he plays, it is a really good matchup for him. He could be a tournament guy, but nothing more. While Bill Hernan Gomez at 39. There is still Dwight Howard around. If you want to believe in revenge games, of course, this is Hernan Gomez's former team. I don't think that there's a massive amount to see here, but I could see him bringing home 20 points, which is enough for cash. I don't think he'd be the number one cash choice, though. Dwight Howard's got a really good matchup. He's been putting up big numbers consistently. 8,800 is pretty expensive. So I think, well, I think you can get 50. I'm not, I don't feel confident in a floor of 44 or 45. So that would lean me towards looking at him for tournaments. While Ennis Cantor at 6,300. If O'Quinn is in, I think that's hard. If O'Quinn is out, I can see Cantor being able to put up those numbers. And that would definitely increase his um, viability, but not to make him a must roster guy. On DraftKings, Dwight at 87, Kemba at 83. I think both of those guys can be used in cash. Obviously, they've got some tournament upside there as well. And Trey Burke at 4,800 is in a pretty strong spot. The same stuff applies to Beasley and Cantor, with uh, Beasley being a tournament guy and Cantor being that player that if O'Quinn is missing, then you can uh, you can look to use him in that spot. Nil Akina, 3,700, maybe in a tournament. But again, he's just not a high producer of fantasy stats majority of the time. The next game up, we're looking at the Los Angeles Lakers and the Detroit Pistons. Brandon Ingram is doubtful while Stan Johnson is questionable. The Pistons are favored by four and a half and the total is 215 points in this one. It's been just monster minutes for these Lakers players continuously. Uh, I know Nate Duncan had a tweet saying it was ludicrous and people, well, what do you expect them to do? They only had eight players available. That's because they sent all their guys to the G League. Thomas Bryant was in the G League. Alex Caruso was in the G League. They didn't need to send those guys to the G League to begin with. And second of all, um, you know, they didn't need to play Travis Ware 17 minutes or Tyler Ennis 17 minutes. Could have played them 26 each instead of playing 45 minutes for their young players who they are, you know, hope don't get injured seriously. At point guard, Lonzo Balls at 8,300. He is putting up numbers despite really not being able to hit any shots. So if the shots actually fall, he does have a 50-point upside here, which makes him an interesting tournament guy, but I wouldn't want to use it for cash. While well, Reggie Jackson at 4,500 played better last game. 22 minutes, 18 points, but it's not enough at that sort of a salary. Come in at 3,900 and I'd be all about it, but at 4,500, I don't see it. Uh, Tyler Ennis, I just don't see the, the minutes being high enough. At shooting guard, KCP's at 6,100. They're going to just bludgeon him with minutes. I like using him in, in this matchup, while Luki Kennard at 46 has been excellent, averaging 30 over the last three with Stan Johnson in doubt. I don't think that it's wrong to use Kennard here. Uh, if Johnson's out, I think he becomes a strong cash play. At small forward, Reggie Bullock's at 4,900. Just doesn't have the variance to his game to really give him massive upside. So I don't really like using him. Uh, Johnson and Ennis, very, that's Jim Ennis, very little to like there. At power forward, love Randall at 7,900. Love the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma at 6,600. Both of those are cash and tournament options, I believe. While Blakey Griffin at 8,800. 
Disappointed last game, just 24 points in 26 minutes, but a really, really nice matchup for Griff and a 45-pointer shouldn't surprise. And you could almost say it's close to expected. So I do like Blake here. Travis Ware and Tone Tolliver. Tone Tolliver played well last game, 37 points for the Pistons at 4,100. The minutes are up for him. The production is up. He could be your tournament guy in a multi, uh, multi-lineup setting. At center, Brookie Lopez is at 6,400. Wasn't great last game, but has been playing well. 33 average over his last five. I think he is a decent tournament guy. He has played well against Andre Drummond in the past. As for Drummond, he is at 10,200 here. It is a really good, uh, it is a really good matchup for him as well, and I think he can get you 50. So he's he's in a pretty good spot there uh, for Drummo, uh, a cash option and a tournament guy. Let's look at things over on DraftKings. Lonzo for tournaments at 78. Same story as on Fangio and a bunch of cash players in this game. A real stackable value game, I think. KCP, Lopez, the future MVP, Drummond and Randall all have some cash value. And you could also add Luke Kennard in there if Stan Johnson misses at 4,500. He could be a, uh, a pretty good option there. Let's go on to the next one. We're looking at the Memphis Grizzlies and the Minnesota Timberwolves. Derek Rose is questionable. Chandler Parsons is also questionable. Very little impact there. Uh, Tyreek Evans is out. He's away with the, from the team for personal reasons. Um, we assume Marcus Gasol is going to play, but having any idea what this Memphis rotation is going to do is pretty tough work. For the Timberwolves, we generally know what's going to happen with that rotation. So Jeff Teague at 7,400. My name is Jeff. Um, shit the bed last time, as pretty much all the Timberwolves did. But I think a bounce back is on the cards in a pretty good matchup for him. No Tyreek. I'm happy to go back to Jeff Teague here despite the disappointment of last game. Or Andy Harrison, excellent last game. 39 points, 37 minutes. He's at 5,800. Now, J.B. Bickerstaff could com- pull a complete switcheroo on us and play him like 21 minutes. But I feel pretty good about using Andy Harrison here. Uh, Rose and Tyus Jones, very, uh, very not interested in those guys. At shooting guard, Jamal Crawford's at 4,200. I no, I don't really see it with him. Or Wigo at 7,000. That's way too high for cash for Wigo, I believe. He's played pretty well with a 34 average over the last five. I would look at it more for tournaments. But if you are going to use Wiggins, this is a good matchup for him. And he's got an opportunity to beat up on a uh, on a pretty poor opponent. Wayne Seldon, Benny McLemore. If you're going to use one of those guys, it's probably Seldon who's getting more consistent minutes. But I just don't really see a massive upside. Dylan Brooksy Brooks is at 4,200, scores well, does very little else, and that makes him a not ideal DFS guy. Well, Nemanja Bielica has been very disappointing disappointing lately, averaging under 20 points over the last five. This is what he's just always done throughout his career. Shows these flashes, and he goes, man, he should start, he's excellent, and then he just completely disappears, and that's what's happening to him now. At 5,800, there is still tournament upside for him to get 40, but I would not want to use him in cash as he's slumping at this at this stage. For the Power Forge, Jarrell Martin's at 5,000. Big game across the weekend, 39 points. I think that he is a, a real chance here for a tournament look again, especially considering I guess he will start at small forward, out of position, but an opportunity to put up some numbers. Taj Gibson at 53. Yeah, yeah don't really see much there. Maybe for cash. Well, Jermichael at 6,600. Also a strong game from him, pulling in some big rebounding numbers. But for 1,600 less, I would take Jarrell Martin over Jermichael Green. At center, we're talking about Carl Anthony Towns at 10,400. He struggled with Marcus Sol in the past. I think you have to consider Towns a tournament guy almost every time he's out there, but this might be the time that I fade him in cash and maybe use a guy like Andre Drummond as opposed to him. As for Gasol, 7,800, way too expensive for cash. Sure, he's got some tournament upside, but I'm not really, uh, not really feeling too much positivity about him. On DraftKings, Towns at 9-3 is in a much better spot. I can use that in cash. Teague at 66 is probably one of the best spots on the board, while Wigo at 65 I also think is a, is a solid cash option. Andy Harrison, I love at 52, and Jarrell Martin at 46. I might even say that's for cash, but he can be a little bit erratic with what he does, but that's still a really sexy price for a guy who could play 30, 31 minutes and, and start at small forward, which I imagine he will. The next game of the day is the Boston Celtics and the Phoenix Suns. The Celtics on a back-to-back. The Suns with Devin Booker and TJ Warren both questionable. Marcus Morris also missed Sunday's game for Boston. He said he is likely to return 
in a game against his former team. At point guard, Terry Rozier, 7,100. Bang, let's go. He's just crushing these numbers pretty much every night he's out there, and it's a, as good a matchup as you could get. Lord Alfred Payton at 5,600 has been fairly shitful most games. Played well last one, had 43 points, but I'm not super interested. Maybe if Booker's out, you throw him into a tournament, but if Booker plays, I want nothing to do with Payton. While Shaney Larkin just spotlighted him, great matchup for Larkin on a back-to-back against a piss-poor opponent. Um, he could find himself play 30 minutes here. He could find himself get steals, seven assists, hit some shots. I think Larkin is an interesting tournament guy here just because of the confluence of events that could lead him to play bigger minutes. At shooting guard, Jalen Brown is at 6,000. Um, yeah, solid return from concussion today. I, I think it's a great matchup for him. I wouldn't want to do it in cash. I think it's more tournament here. Well, Devin Booker at 7,200, if he actually plays, which we don't know. Uh, I would be into that in cash if he plays, but we just have no idea at this point. Troy Daniels, Shaq Harrison, Abdul Nadir. Daniels at 3,800 would be an excellent option if Booker is out, especially at that price. Joshy Jackson's at 7,200. Tournament, but if TJ Warren's out, cash. I I like it a lot for cash if Warren is out, whereas Warren at 6,500, I won't do anything with that. Or Jace Tatum at 6,600. I think that's too expensive with the return of Brown and the likely return of Marcus Morris. I don't think you could do it in cash, despite how good this uh, matchup is. Marquise Chris at 4,400. Will he start again? Maybe. Can he drop 30? Sure. Can he drop 10? Absolutely. So we're looking at him as a tournament option, but I'm more into him in tournaments in this game than I have been in the past. Drug and Bender, no interest. While Marcus Morris at 5,700. Morris has been exceeding that value pretty consistently. But with the return of Brown, it does cut a little bit of his playing time out. But at 5,700, yeah, I could definitely see using it in cash. I'd probably lean to more towards tournaments. But the matchup uh, and the way he's been playing, there is there is something there for Marcus. At center, Al Horford's at 6,800. I like Horford here. He played well today. Another great opportunity to use him, I believe. Well, Alex Land coming off the bench, but averaging 33 over his last three. A real strong tournament option, despite the way the Celtics defend the center position. Len has been racking up some numbers. You can have zero confidence in him. I have zero confidence, but the upside of 35, perhaps 40 points for Len is too much to ignore. Bainesy, Greg Munro, eh, not really interested in either of those guys. Uh, on DraftKings, I like Joshy Jackson, Jalen Brown, Alex Lennon, Marquise Chris. All those guys are tournament guys with Jackson at 6,700, really converting to a cash guy if Warren is out. Jalen Brown at 5,100, I also think would be a, could be a cash player. I could see you doing that. Well, Al Horford at 63, I like that in cash, and I like it in tournaments. Well, Devin Booker at 7,500, a little bit more expensive than Fangio, but still, it's Devin Booker, and I think you could use him if he plays. But of course, we don't know that at this stage. Let's look at the other sites now for Yahoo, for GPPs. Benny Simmons, Al Horford, Brookie Lopez, Marquise Chris. Uh, they're your tournament only guys. And the other guys here are for cash and tournaments. Canard, Jamal Crawford, Greggy Munro, Reggie Jackson, Frank Kaminsky, Reggie Bullock, Jarrell Martin, Andy Harrison, Alex Len, Jeff Teague, Dwight Howard, Lonzo Ball, Andre Drummond, Julius Randle, and Joel Embiid. Moneyball for tournaments, Embiid, Drummond, Howard, Alex Len, Marquise Chris, Frank the Tank Kaminsky, and for cash and tournaments, we've got Reggie Jackson, Jarrell Martin, Andy Harrison, Timmy Hardaway, KCP, Rosier, Barton, Kuzma, Teague, Lonzo Ball, Nick Jokic, and Julius Randle. And on Draft Stars, we've got for tournaments, Simmons, Dwight, Al Horford, KCP, Wigo, Sharich, Jalen Brown, Marquise Chris, Bill Hernan Gomez, Travis Weir, and Tyler Ennis. And for cash, we've got Shaney Larkin, Reggie Jackson, Jarrell Martin, Andy Harrison, Bielitsa, Brookie Lopez, Kuzma, Teague, Blake Griffin, Lonzo, Randall, Jokic, Towns, and Embiid. If your fantasy season is done, congratulations, and thank you for still listening. We're still going to be providing yeah, podcasts all the way through the postseason uh, and through the off-season. We'll be heading into, or even in the, the latter stages of the um, uh, of the postseason, we'll be doing team reviews to help you guys in Dynasty Leagues get an idea of where this team stands and the way players can progress. That'll all, all be coming. If you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, go and leave a five-star review and a rating. It's a great way of helping this show. You can also find the show on Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube where you can subscribe, you can comment, and you can give me a thumbs up, a great way of showing some support for the podcast. 
I recorded a great episode of Locked On NBA today covering the Sixers, the Cavs, and the Wizards. So go check out Locked On NBA as, re- as well as the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network on Twitter at Locked On NBA Net and the new website LockedOnSports.com where your NFL, Major League Baseball, and NBA needs are met. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Anthony Tolliver.